Perhaps the easiest thing to say about John F. Kennedy was that he was a man of many contradictions. An unlikely survivor from birth, he managed not only to survive, but to succeed and thrive at the very highest levels of society. As president, he projected an image of youthful vigor and swagger. While at least physically, the truth was anything but. His reckless and oftentimes destructive personal behavior stood in sharp contrast to the carefully manicured image projected from the White House of a doting father and devout family man. In politics, his passion and preference were unquestionably for matters of foreign affairs. Yet his greatest triumph may have been his call for sacrifice and service at home. And though the tangible achievements of his administration may have been minimal, the myth and memory that is John F. Kennedy and the world of Camelot remains unparalleled. In this eight-part documentary, we will cover John F. Kennedy's life from barely surviving birth to the tragic events in Dallas on November 22, 1963. We will highlight the major turning points, including his early years, military life, and becoming a congressman and senator up through the 1960 presidential race against Richard Nixon. We will detail the short two years and 10 months he served as president, from his inspirational inauguration speech, asking not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, up through his final days in Dallas and all points in between. Finally, we'll take a look at John F. Kennedy's legacy through the present day and beyond. In the course of the journey, we hope to present a clear and concise portrait of the man and the myth that helped shape a new world order. The Kennedy presidency is such a brief but you know, fully loaded, you know, of event. I mean, uh, in such a short span of time, to have to contend with so many unanticipated big things lends a dimension to that that few presidents share. I mean, on top of the fact that it's a, a, a presidency so largely on film, made by film, captured on film. His rise and the role of the camera and his death and the role of the camera. I mean, there's, you know, like bookends uh, to his presidency. John Fitzgerald Kennedy, called Johnny by his father, but better known as Jack to the rest of the family and friends, was born at 83 Beale Street in Brookline, Massachusetts, May 29, 1917, the second son of Joseph P. Kennedy and Rose Fitzgerald. His maternal grandfather, John F. Fitzgerald, was the first Irish-American mayor of Boston who served three terms between 1906 and 1914. Jack's paternal grandfather, Patrick J. Kennedy, was a successful liquor importer who held significant interests in the coal and banking industries. From the very beginning, John Fitzgerald Kennedy's world was one of wealth and privilege, advantages that would serve him well, both socially and politically throughout his life. Rose and Joe had married in 1914, and breaking from tradition, bought a home in the mostly Protestant community of Brookline, Massachusetts. With the Kennedy family life firmly centered around Joe Sr.'s seemingly insatiable drive and ambition, Jack's mother, Rose, oftentimes found herself overwhelmed with the burden of raising a young and soon to be very large family on her own. For the first 17 years of the marriage, Rose was either pregnant or recovering from pregnancy. To escape her unhappy home life, Rose traveled extensively around America and Europe, 
leaving the children to be raised mostly by servants and relatives. Uh, I think it would be really a big challenge to grow up in the Kennedy family with a father as dominant uh, and as directing uh, as the Kennedy patriarch. And the dynamic among the children and the rivalries among the children would be uh, a, a real challenge to grow up into. The expectations were high. Um, and for John, whose physical frame was hardly strong and virile, just the opposite of what most people think about, it was particularly challenging. He was a weaker um, person. Um, and uh, he looked up, of course, to his older brother, who was a hero in a World War II, you know, um, and, and to uh, achieve the same sort of ability as his uh, older brother was a, a tough thing from his father's perspective. Much of Jack's youth was spent in the shadow of his older brother, Joe Jr. Jack and his brother's relationship was marked by a good-natured but intense competitiveness, with Jack hoping to set himself apart from his high-achieving brother and make a name for himself on his own. But when Joe Jr. was killed in a secret bombing mission over Germany in August of 1944, Jack did not hesitate to pick up the political torch from his late brother. A few years later, in the spring of 1948, Jack was once again visited by tragedy when his closest sibling, his sister Kathleen, was killed in a plane crash en route to France when her plane struck the side of a mountain. Jack had discovered an interest in politics in 1937 after his freshman year at Harvard, when he and his best friend, Lem Billings, along with Jack's prized Ford sedan convertible with fold-down top, sailed for Europe. The 10 weeks spent driving around the continent would help spark an ambitious and serious political education that would last a lifetime. Well, there's always a kind of a curious paradox here because or a contradiction, because Joe Kennedy is a, you know, a, a isolationist when it comes as a diplomat into World War II, but he's a, a, a staunch interventionist when it comes to his children and the, the careers of his children. I mean, he takes a direct and active interest in all of their activities, uh, directing them. And I think for John, especially, um, uh, he felt both the pull of that and also wanted to resist that a little bit, as you'll see in his career when he, you know, he becomes more of an interventionist. And, and that's in large part, of course, due to his travels in the 30s in Europe and seeing what was happening with the fascist rise and uh, Hitler Germany and fascist Italy and all of that. So, And the response in the Western democracies of uh, what would later be called appeasement or enabling the rise of these countries and these totalitarian regimes. Uh, that was something John Kennedy uh, would see as very alarming. When Jack returned to Harvard, based on his experiences in Europe, he wrote his senior thesis, Appeasement in Munich. In it, he argued that England was unprepared for Hitler's advances. With the help and encouragement of family friend and New York Times columnist Arthur Kroc, Appeasement in Munich was revised and released in book form, retitled, Why England Slept. The book was widely read, and most significantly, was a direct departure from his famous father's isolationist views. Joe Sr. had been made ambassador to the United Kingdom by Roosevelt in 1940. But because of his strong isolationist views, after the Battle of Britain was relieved of the position. A few years later, when Joe Jr. was killed over Germany in a secret bombing mission, Joseph Kennedy would blame his son's death on what he felt was Roosevelt's march to war. He had to um, exhibit strength and uh, uh, you know, a, a commitment to duty for the United States, a very patriotic individual. And it was absolutely incredible. It was absolutely essential that he participate in this conflict. That other 
uh, Harvard people and other Ivy League people and other people of his class would be expected to do. And he had to absolutely follow suit with that, um, regardless even of what his personal ambitions might be. I mean, it was part of that social um, um, element that he participated in and had to follow suit. John Kennedy felt it was his duty to join the war effort. But because of chronic health issues, he failed to pass the required physical examination from both the Army and the Navy. It took Joe Sr. arranging for the readministration of the Navy physical for him to finally pass. Jack's father expected his son to be tucked away, stationed in some remote corner of the war, far from harm's way. But Jack had no intention of shirking his duty. He was determined to fight, and in the spring of 1943, took command of PT-109, a patrol torpedo boat operating in the hotly contested Solomon Islands. In the morning hours of August 2nd, 1943, on a mission to torpedo a Japanese fleet attempting to escape the U.S. Navy, Jack's boat was struck by a Japanese destroyer, cutting the PT boat in half. Two of Jack's men were killed instantly. And along with the rest of his crew, Jack was left clinging to the hull of the PT boat, surrounded by oil flames. Swimming for more than five hours, leading his crew, Jack managed to drag a badly injured sailor by his life vest until they finally reached the closest island. As the story goes, Jack carved their location on a coconut shell and gave it to native islanders who agreed to take the shell to Rendova, the PT's main base. The islanders returned the next day with a note from a New Zealand lieutenant stationed on New Georgia. And a day later, the seventh day of their ordeal, Jack left with the natives by canoe for New Georgia. After the war, John Kennedy had the coconut shell shellacked in heavy plastic. The shell was kept on the corner of his desk so he could keep it as a permanent memento of the ordeal. With a nudge from Joe Sr., the tale of Jack's heroism made an immediate splash in the newspapers doing much to shape Jack's future image. When asked how he became a war hero, Jack joked, it was easy. They cut my boat in half. The PT-109 um, uh, experience for John Kennedy is going to be absolutely critical for his political life. Uh, at the time, and much so even later, when Hollywood will, you know, of course, make the movie and, and what president or even a candidate for president wouldn't want Hollywood to make a blockbuster film about an incident in your life in the war and then have one of the leading you know, actors of the day, Cliff Robertson, play the leading role. I mean, this is, uh, you can't buy that kind of, <laughs> of celebrity. And it's gonna play tremendously into Kennedy's um, political career image-wise, a hero, a wounded veteran, um, uh, courageous to the very end, caring for his men. Uh, that will play very well when he uh, campaigns politically for the presidency. So even at the time and then later, um, that's, that really encourages and advances his image as a youthful, strong, um, uh, brave individual. In 1944, Joe Sr. offered to help Congressman James Michael Curley, the former mayor of Boston, with his legal and financial troubles in exchange for Curley vacating his seat in the House of Representatives. Curley agreed, and 29-year-old John F. Kennedy won the seat in 1946. There's little doubt that John Kennedy's chances of success uh, in politics in Massachusetts uh, dependent entirely on his father. Um, I mean, we're still talking about the legacy of Catholics in Massachusetts. I mean, uh, it's a Protestant realm. It, they're still dealing with that legacy of prejudice. They're, they're dealing with the fact that uh, it's gonna cost a fortune and John Kennedy's gonna have a available bank account. 
and uh, Joe Kennedy is going to make sure that people know about his son and he's going to uh, pay a lot of money to have people say good things and to and to even step away from political office in, in order to, for his son to take their place. So he, the father is going to be very dominant in all aspects of his son's campaign. And, it, and it's going to be very important, especially because John Kennedy's just not a natural campaigner. He is not uh, an extroverted, outgoing, populist type of figure. I mean, he's not a Tammany Hall type politician. He's reserved. He's uh, cautious. He's kind of a, a quieter individual. And to have him go out shaking hands, um, meeting people he wouldn't ordinarily meet on a daily basis was really difficult for him. Um, and he's going to need a lot of uh, training and support and encouragement from his father and others. Jack? at least initially, was not well suited for political life. He was not yet an effective public speaker, with audiences finding him awkward, stiff, and insecure. When he mingled with voters, which he was reluctant to do, he seemed aloof and uncomfortable. He was careless with his schedule, and audiences were often left waiting an hour or more. When asked why he was running for office, he often said that he was taking over for his brother Joe. He's not going into politics as a rabble rouser to make enormous changes in things. He's going into politics because it's expected of him. Uh, and, and quite frankly, I think he sees who's in politics and he looks at them as sort of inferior beings. And, and if, if they're doing it, why aren't I doing it? Uh, I, mean, I mean, his sense of self... Uh, his intelligence, his, uh, his social class. I, I actually think he was compelled in many ways just because of the uh, low quality of what he saw uh, as his competition. And if they can do it, he could certainly do it and do it better. The problem was getting there. I mean, the, the fuss and bother of going through all of the politics of obtaining a seat. Six years later, in Jack's run for Senate, Joe Sr. would again step in this time firing one of Jack's most trusted aides and replacing him with Jack's younger brother, Bobby. When Joe Sr. found out that the influential Boston Post was going to come out in favor of Jack's opponent, Henry Cabot Lodge, Joe Sr. met with the publisher, John Fox, and managed to change his mind. Shortly after the meeting, the financially strapped publisher received a half million dollar loan from Jack's father. Jack paid little attention to how the campaign was financed. He never asked where the money came from or how it was spent. And he continued to use his family as a well-heeled sideshow attraction for his appearances. It was during this period that Jack would be introduced to his future wife, Jacqueline Bouvier. The couple were married on September 12, 1953, one year after Jack was elected senator. Four years later, in 1957, after enduring a miscarriage and a stillbirth, the couple gave birth to their first child, Caroline. Um, having obtained those seats, he's not going to take a leading role. He's not going to be an active um, uh, a figure. It's largely, uh, you know, to uh, uh, make a step for other offices and a greater ambition, but he's not really working uh, that hard. Um, he likes uh, and appreciates and feels he deserves the, the recognition of political office, uh, but that office doesn't mean he has to work all that hard. Kennedy served two terms as senator, mostly without distinction. Though in 1956, while serving on the Select Committee on Labor, Kennedy took a strong stand against corruption and racketeering within the Teamsters Union. Jack's brother, Bobby, who served as the committee's chief counsel, had discovered several financial irregularities within the union, including Teamster Vice President Jimmy Hoffa taking $85,000 from union funds to pay for personal bills. The investigations were televised, and Jack's aggressive questioning 
turned him into a national political figure. Well, the fact is, though, that you were paying them a bribe then. I was paying him a bribe, a bribe. I paid it with the complete knowledge of the United States I'm government. I'm not talking now about that. I'm talking about your own responsibility. You know that that's prohibited by law for you to pay a bribe. Well, there's no bribe as far as I was concerned. We're talking about the fact that you gave $175 a week in cash to Mr. McHugh, and it was your impression at the time you were giving it that it was going into his pocket now. Isn't that correct? No, it was not my impression it was going in his pocket. He advised us for the needy union men and yes, friends. but you've already testified that at first you believed him and that then you didn't. Isn't that correct? Uh, later on, later on, I was, from what various statements they said and what I heard at Tobahanna, I was of the opinion that probably they were lying to me. Often absent from the Senate while undergoing several spine operations, it was during one of these convalescences that John Kennedy found time to write Profiles in Courage. The book profiled senators who risked their careers for their beliefs and would eventually give him the distinction of being the only American president to win the Pulitzer Prize. Though, as with many of his early accolades, the prize was not without controversy. The book was never proposed by the Pulitzer Board as a candidate for the Biography Prize and only became nominated after much lobbying from Arthur Kroc, the family friend and columnist who had helped push why England slept into the spotlight 15 years earlier. It was also revealed in Ted Sorensen's 2008 memoir that Sorensen had helped co-write the book. John Kennedy of Massachusetts, is an outstanding American. John Kennedy of Massachusetts is a great Democrat. John Kennedy of Massachusetts is a successful campaigner and a successful candidate every time he has run for public office. Convention will be in order. In 1956, at the Democratic Convention, Jack Kennedy took one step closer to center stage when he came in second to Estes Kefauver as the party's nominee to be Adlai Stevenson's running mate. Mr. Chairman, Tennessee, Mr. Chairman, Tennessee respectfully requests the opportunity for candidate Albert Gore to make a brief announcement. Sure. Mr. Chairman, with thanks to this great free democratic convention, I request that my name be withdrawn in favor of my colleague, Senator Estes Kefauver. Senator John Davis. Kennedy of Massachusetts. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen of uh, this convention, I want to uh, take this opportunity first to express my appreciation to Democrats from all parts of the country, north and south, east and west, who have been uh, so generous and kind to me uh, this afternoon. I think that it proves, as uh, nothing else could prove, what a strong and united party the Democratic Party is. <laughs> Secondly, I think what has happened today bears out the good judgment of Governor Stevenson in deciding that this issue should be taken to the floor of the convention. Because I believe that the Democratic Party will go from this convention far stronger for what we have done here today. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, recognizing that this convention has selected a man who has campaigned in all parts of the country, who has worked entirely for the party, who will serve as an admirable running mate to Governor Stevenson, I hope that this convention will make Estes Kefauver's nomination unanimous. Thank you. It was shortly after the 1956 election that with enthusiastic support from his family, Jack privately decided to run for president. 